All right. Thank you for tuning in. You are listening to Gnostic Studies. And we're going to continue our... <clears throat> we're going to continue our Gnostic Runology series with the seventh rune today, the Hagal rune. So we want to invite you to join us for that. But before we do so, as usual, we're going to jump into the previous class. In this case, the Kaun Kaum rune. Ka, also called Ka. So we're going to do a quick review of that. Having some technical issues on our end, so you want to apologize for the delay, but uh, we're going to keep it moving because we got it connected. And if you have any questions or comments, as always, feel free to leave them in the comments area. So the previous rune is the sixth rune. We looked at a couple different authors, so we'll just review quickly what they said. Fischbach, 1900. He said this rune is easy to interpret. On the fire altars, two pieces of wood were placed on the right and the left, between which fat or oil was lit on the altar plate. The elevated point in the middle of this plate like depression served to put the wick holder which achieved the slow burning of the oil or fat as a steady flame we see on other simpler richer consecrated roman altars this basic form of the fire altar represented since resinous wood kainholz in german blazed the fastest and the most intensely it was placed there on the right and the left of the altar for the hands of the priest to be able to give the fire to the congregation. So he could light a piece of resinous wood. Nowadays, people may be familiar with Palo Santo. That's We could call that a resinous wood. Light that up and pass that down so that the congregation also has access to the fire and they can uh, hold it, pass it around. So that's one aspect, is resinous wood used in the fire worship ceremonies is the symbolic meaning of this rune. Next, he also calls it keel wood. The keel is the, the ship's spine or center line or backbone. It's, it's the whole... A middle piece of a, of a wood ship. Well, maybe on other ships too, but I think he was talking about a wood ship. So it means like the spine of the vessel or the vehicle that moved on water. Very interesting when we start to get into the other meanings if we understand the language of symbolism there. Then about... Six, seven years later, Guido von Liszt, he says that Ka Kaun Khan refers to Chu, pine, or another resinous wood, keel or boat, daring or bold, as well as none or nothing, and so on. The Yagdraso world tree means, in the narrower sense, the Aryan folk lineage or trunk. Remember, he has a little... Uh, little racist flavor here but we're looking at it for historical purposes so we can understand besides which the funk lineage trunk of foreign races as are seen in savage wild trees so he's trying to make a uh, metaphor saying that that other wood other trees are wild but but uh, the Yagdrasil tree isn't so he says that the term kaun kuna means a maiden uh, we're having
having some kind of issue here. Reconnection successful. Sorry about that. Hopefully it's working still. Uh, we'll continue on our end. Uh, but yeah, to look at the, the savage, we should look at the savage or wild elements, that is elements lacking order, as uh, egoic contamination of our interior world. And so by, by working on those, we can realize who the real raging enemy is, that's the ego inside of us. Then moving on about 15 years later, the the Kun or Karun, according to Kurtzon, 1924. Exoterically, he says it means justice. Esoterically, the feminine principle in the universe. And generally, to chu maiden can or able, right? Like capable, pine, keel or boat, bold, and none. Very similar to what Guido von Lee said. He says that the word kuna also means maiden, and it reminds us of the Latin term kunas, meaning woman and vagina. One can see quite well the expression of this rune through the life of every people in the symbol of balancing justice, which the female gender seems indeed qualified to perform. And one will therefore understand if this room belongs to or represents the planet Venus. Gorslebin, about five years after that, he says it's the letter K, sometimes the letter G, and then number six. It means gender or lineage. We could say sex, but sex in the context of gender. That is a person's gender, their sex. The uh, kind torch, burning, heat, rust, uh, rut, lust, as well as the caduceus staff, the royal will, Conan's will, Conan, Konig's willin, which creates forms with skill and boldness. Here we see bold coming up again, to be bold, to be daring shapes peoples and ennobles and improves the sexes through the wise organization of the reproductive instinct. The Ur word means that which exi is existing. He says that the trunk words or seed words are expressions of reproduction and propagation. And the image of the rune with the angled branch or escalating line clearly shows a sprouting or budding that is a lineage. The rune is composed of the east rune, the east line representing the self or the inner being, the divine self, the vertical line, as well as the bar line, the lifeline, the ascending line. But bar also means son or child. And so the ka kaun rune means life, the son or child, the offspring who comes from our self, like the branch that comes from the trunk of the tree. In order for something to come from, there has to be an ability, a capacity or a skill. Birth is always a bending, an angle in the straight line of procreation. Be aware of the seed sprout in the rune image. The torch, the procreator of light, the light pole, the phallus. The rune is also an image of the pine torch, which produces fire and brings light. The Annunciation is uh, when a, uh, the angel appeared before Mary in Christian religion in order to tell her something. 
And he says that the angel always has a stiff stem of a lily in its hand. And in the Kala, the Nordic Kabbalah, the lily is the world tree, the family tree, but it is also a phallic symbol. The Annunciation announces to Mary the human incarnation, the spiritual proclamation of God through her. The incarnation of the Christ through the divine feminine. The Kun Rune, from the Kun Rune, the number six is also derived, as is the letter G, which looks like a six, and the word gender. The K stands sound stands for that which is internally derived, the ability, capacity, a skill in physical and knowledge in the spiritual. It is the king's rune, the expert rune of the skilled, the proficient, the capable, the one who can, the one who is wealthy in every regard by means of their material and procreative resources. He mentions the, the elect, Kyrios, Greek for Lord, the elect. Kona in the German languages means woman, female, kuna, girl. The carafe, the jug or vase, has always been a feminine symbol like every vessel. And with this we have the R Kona. The R woman, the eagle woman, the sun woman. But in ancient Nordic, kuna means lower, L-O-R-E. Therefore, R kuna can, al can also be named the R kunde, the lore of R, the lore of the eagle, the sunlight service. R kuna reminds us of arcana, the arcanum, the great arcanum. The Ur knowledge, the solar lore, which was kept secret and represented by a female eagle who appears on the coat of arms of Nuremberg, for example. All right, and then finally, Kumar of our historical review. He says that it is the rune of pure conscious procreation and reproduction or propagation. Of cause and effect, of balancing justice, numerical value six. Its K sound indicates spiritual or physical ability in cures, in art, expertise, skillfulness, as well as king and queen. It is a more feminine rune in contrast to the East rune. It is a female symbol, the sun woman, the knower of the high R, the Norn. They were like the... Um, lords of karma the k rune is also the rune of the royal art of magic astrology and runic lore it is the rune of the secret knowledge tradition the kala the rune represents the ka humanity the turning point of the winter solstice with raised hands the resurrected one its demonic or inverted form is the ko rune sunken wisdom Sunken law and order, self-centeredness, mismanagement, abomination, and greed. The rune position demands unconditional purity of spirit from the practitioner. The exercise, hold your arms up. Well, you start in the ich rune position, right? Military out of tension, hands on the sides. Then you raise your arms up, diagonally, palms facing forward. And then receive the, uh, the waves. This rune, when you first start doing it, you may not even need to do a mantra. This one is very interesting. You can already just feel the energy without doing anything. You can, um, there's, there's different ways to do it, but uh, I'll just leave it at that. If you do it facing the sun uh, or facing uh, nature. So he represents or he gives... Uh, a couple different ways uh, or he says here if one does this exercise in the sun or moonlight then one will feel the K wave even more intensified you can do 
ka as the mantra and turn from north to the east one will perceive a kind of loosening and ringing in the navel one will also experience an unspeakably beautiful high all connectedness spiritual doors open deeper insights into life on this side and beyond which are revealed to the pure aspiring practitioner but this does not cover the karun in its entire depth seek a pure conscious will then you too will find it after you do the rune you want to say this affirmation i can i will to become a rune expert the k room can also be felt very well using the sound formula ka ke ki ko ku. Those who do rune exercises with egotistical thoughts and evil wishes will have to pay heavily for it. He says he's giving a warning. The mantra or mudra, sorry, is uh, with the left hand, thumb out, ka ke ki ko ku, concentrating on spiritual equilibrium, higher capabilities or skills, and spiritual procreation. He also gives in here a uh, transmutation exercise, I believe it is. Oh, no, he says he says not to cut your hair uh, because you receive waves through your hair. <clears throat> I think you can receive the waves without that because that's been my experience. But each one of us has to decide for ourselves. Now we're looking at the Gnostic and Rosicrucian. Where a kocha. The Rita rune, the fifth rune, with its hidden significance of justice and uprightness, has impressed the positive part, the human part, upon us. In us, it exerts its influence on the glands of the internal secretion of male hormones and affects the internal rhythm. But we should not neglect here our rhythm or the female part in us, and for that we're directed to the practices of the K rune. The rune is called Kaun in the Nordic Mysteries, and although Rita, the Rita rune is under the influence of Jupiter, Kaun is subject to Venus, numeric value 6, the stones that correspond to it, it's interesting, he gives crystallite and agate. In the mysteries, it's said to sh uh, shelter under this rune during the summer solstice and June 20th, the day of the roses, sometimes called the day of St. John. In the summer, it's like the opposite of Christmas, the opposite time. <clears throat> And so we recommend that you do this rune during that period between June uh, 19th or 20th through the 24th, all the way through, even to the 25th, every day. Very interesting. A high initiate told us that the K rune is the sword of the magician, and it was very difficult for us to understand how it also signified the woman. For us, the sword and the woman appear to be in rare contrast to each other. Kaun in our ritual are the forces of Nut, the feminine principle or eternal feminine, as the great poet and philosopher Goethe calls her. Kaun gives us the basis for the German word Konen, ability or power, and the word can in English, capable. And this comes to reveal to us some more of the mystery of the rune. The strange structure of this rune is composed of the Is rune and an arm like a beaker providing the sword for the magician. Let's consider that the Nordics called a master or a guide a Kuru, which crept into India with the same meaning. But the Nordic peoples were not guided by male magicians, but only by intermediary priestesses, through whose mouths only the divinity spoke. This explains the double meaning of the Kaun rune, sword and woman, at the same time. However, the woman, the wife, can only serve as a guide to the man with whom she is harmoniously united, and this usually happens when in marriage. 
On the other hand, we have the male and female glands. With the exercises of this rune, we will develop the character of rhythms of the female glands. Ka, Khan, Kon, Kon are the names of the Egyptian deity whose significance is the astral body. It is necessary to take into account that the astral is the intermediary between the divine and the eternal spirit in all its extension and the material body that we possess. With these explanations, those who look and see with discerning eyes will have noticed that we have unveiled, as much as possible, the veil of the mystery. Kama, among the Indians, in addition to signifying the desires, also symbolizes sexual union. The goddess Freya had the K rune as a shield, and Freya signifies Easter redemption. She is Ostara, the Ostara of the Germans. The coat of arms for the city of Nuremberg has an eagle with the head of a woman on it, the Arkonas, Arkona, Arkaun. Ar signifies the sun. It is the sun woman, the female principle of the solar forces, which we must learn how to handle. Sexual magic is difficult when there is not a trained willpower. He's talking about white tantra. Thus, the previous rune, Rita, only goes with the subjective forces of the will. This is how we can verify the experiences of high sexual magic. Rhythm law is necessary in everything before we can go deeper into these mysteries, because the more we touch them, the greater they should appear to our eyes. But it is necessary to prepare, to predispose the student in order to make them recognize and comprehend, so as to be able to open their senses and to be like the petals of a rose, which is open to the sun, waiting to bind all the honey and exhale all the perfumes. The same rune according to Samael Owen Veor. He mentions that uh, there was a master, a fallen master named Jave, who uh, started practicing black tantrism. And his wife chose not to practice and uh, preferred divorce. Jave is the demon who tempted Jesus the Christ. And Jesus answered, saying unto him, it is said, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. In those times of ancient Egypt, the one we call Samaelun Veor entered into the Egyptian mysteries as a neophyte, in spite of being a bodhisattva. He had to pass through rigorous studies and esoteric disciplines, and when he arrived at the ninth door, he was taught the great mysteries of sex. Then his guru communicated the unutterable secret of the great arcanum to him. In this day and age, what happened then could be considered scandalous. Therefore, in this day and age, the Maithuna, white tantra, must only be practiced between husband and wife within intelligently constituted marriages. In ancient Egypt, those who violated their oaths and divulged the great arcanum were condemned to death. Their heads were cut off, their hearts were torn out, and their bodies were cremated. Their ashes were thrown to the four winds. The mysterious K rune represents the priestess wife and the flaming sword. The Kaum rune, with its Kabbalistic six, vibrates with maximum intensity within the sphere of Venus, the planet of love. Men and women of the world, you must know that it is only possible to put that annular serpentine fire into activity with the Maithuna, white tantra. We urgently need to learn how to wisely manipulate the eternal feminine principle of the solar forces. Let's remember the eagle with a woman's head, the sun woman, the foundation of the great work. All right, we'll, we'll stop our review there. So we want to open it up if you guys have any questions or comments, but we're going to continue uh going 
Yeah, it looked like uh, somebody commented that the the connection is poor today, so we apologize. But hopefully it's still going. For you. Uh, all right. Let's see what we got here. All right, so we're doing the Hagal rune. That's today's rune. The Hagal Hakel, or H rune, according to Frederick Fischbach, 1900. In co close relation to the Kain rune, one we just reviewed, this rune stands as the character for H because it is the hook or connection rune. The previous designation that Hagal is hail is senseless. Too little attention was paid to the fact that Haklin Hakel equals binding equals connecting. To assume the meaning of this rune to be hail as in projectiles of the Valkyries, may be poetic, but it is far-fetched. So what has the Hekel rune to do with fire worship? You know, because Fischbach always brings it back to fire worship. Very much. The depicted consecrated altar shows two logs fastened with cords. This symbolizes the rotation cords as well as the connection with the trinity of the Godhead triple right three so there's three lines the connection line so there's one line these two parallel lines in the n shape and then an, a line that connects in that connects the two the connection line is often doubled in the rune you can see it there or there as a rule it is the two parallel altar woods that appear connected exceptionally we also see crossed woods united by a vertical line The line connecting the wood pieces is found as volutes, or spiral ornaments, on the ionic column capitals, which can thus be explained from an inverted altar plate. The sacred woods were transformed into foliage wreaths. What somehow belonged to fire worship was then used as a motif in temple ornamentation. Its basic scheme remained even after its meaning and worship had fallen into obscurity. The road fire altars were similar to pyramids or triangular shapes, and furthermore, the fire cords were used in this scheme. It was then so richly unfolded, aesthetically pleasing and colorful, that the ideal basic form is veiled or hardly recognizable. The Hagal Hag Ha rune, according to Guido von Liszt, the all nurturing, all cherishing, to enclose, as well as hail and to destroy. A seventh I know, if I see a fire, high around the house of men, however wide it burns, I will bring it to rest, with taming magical songs. Hagal, the inner feeling or introspectiveness, the consciousness of carrying one's God with all his characteristics enclosed within oneself. This introspectiveness produces a high self-confidence in the force of the individual spirit, which gives miraculous power. This miraculous power is inherent in all humans who believe in it with a strong spirit, convinced beyond any shadow of a doubt. Christ was one of these rare persons, as was Votan. And he said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, if someone were to say to this stone, Move yourself away, and he believes in it, then this stone would lift itself away and fly into the sea. Sustained by this consciousness, which is beyond any shadow of a doubt, the Chosen One controls the physical and the spiritual realms 
which is contained all-inclusively, and thereby one feels oneself to be all-powerful. Therefore, he says, this is his motto, lovingly care for the universe in yourself, and you will control the universe. <clears throat> According to Guido von Liesten, another uh, runic author, or German esotericist, A. Frank Glan, this rune is neither a vowel nor a consonant, but is instead the aspiration sound, which means to pronounce the letter H at the beginning of the word, so make the sound while inhaling. Agal, according to Ernst Tristan Kurtzon. Exoterically, wisdom, androgyny. Esoterically, God's self. Generally, to nourish or cherish the universe, to enclose, as well as hail, to destroy, air, wind, etc. This rune is not, as has often been erroneously assumed, and essentially mischief rune. But rather the opposite. For so whosoever feels God in themselves, whosoever cherishes and encloses God in themselves as the universe, no harm can come to them at all, since they no longer feel themselves as being one with their physical body, and thus they are truly wise. On the other hand, this rune, which is composed of the man rune, spirit, and the woman rune, substance, is the full symbol of that androgyny, the male-female, which not only dominates the cosmos everywhere, but also allows it to come into being in a perceptible way. In my opinion, Kurtzon says, the actual inherent mischief of this rune for the discerning person lies in the cold meaning of this rune as a secret emblem for the flesh body upon which our actual self Jesus Christ the Son in us is crucified furthermore one may have to know that the rain mixed with hail comes from the cosmos as a fire extinguisher thus it is first benefactor and later became a mischief maker arbitrarily through magic this happened by laying out Hagal rune staffs or Hagal runes secretly on the blooming fields of envied neighbors, a custom which unfortunately is practiced even today in different regions of Germany from time to time, probably because the average person is closer to evil than to good. Therefore, this rune belongs to the cold and hostile but wise planet Saturn. Hagal, Halga, Galga, Gilg, according to Gorsleben. Uh, about another five years later. The H, letter H and number seven. Hagal equals all hog. In the Nordic realm, Hagal is represented by the hooked or multiplication cross, that is the swastika or an X shape which is elevated to be a processional image, meaning a picture or a banner in a funeral procession. So it's something like this or this, where they're holding this and they're walking. In the Germanic realm, Hagal is represented by the rear gate of the healing enclosure, a place where you, let's say the doctor's office, the rear gate of the doctor's office. It is only through the idea of cultivating perfection in the species, according to blood and disposition, that the family becomes a clan. It's a very interesting uh, statement here. I don't know why this isn't with the uh, marriage rune, which is a uh, 17th rune, the Ehe rune or Eh rune. But anyway, he mentions it here. Again, we're keeping it because of the uh, historical significance. It's a very interesting statement. Let me read it to you again. It is only through the idea of cultivating perfection in the species 
that the family becomes a clan. When the priests still mastered the art of human cultivation or human breeding, then marriage was the time to nurture what is elevated. It should be high cultivation. Marriage should be high cultivation, is what he's saying. Not sure how he's relating it to these two, other than this rune is the union of the man and woman runes, man and uh, the man and the year rune, or man and year. Tulcher's ur word is really a phrase that means eternal change or eternal exchange. A seventh I learned, if the hall is burning, with fire around benches and comrades, however bright it burns, I will banish the blaze as soon as I sing the magic chant. The Hagal rune is the hieroglyphic, the holy script. It is a pictographic script of the all hag, the all embracing, the world all, Allah il Allah, wal hal, the God all, the one all or all one, the man all, the male all, the human all. Hagal, holy, Galga, lily, remember he mentioned lily before, the cohesion of the world. It is the basic structure for the formation of crystals. This rune is the basic structure for the formation of crystals when you look from the top down. On the parchment of a very old prayer, this rune appears in the place of the God syllable, which was Ga, G-A, and is therefore a sacred character. In its negative or inverse aspect, it was also called Hagel, represented by the, the tipped over rune, which signifies death, destruction, as well as air and wind. This is the tipped over rune that he mentioned, Hagel. The Hagal rune represents the world cross with the radix, which is Latin, it means root, the hub in the middle, in the point of intersection of its branches around which the world turns on its axis, spiritually as well as physically. So this brings up an interesting idea of, of things turning, right, going around, circular, uh, circulating around like a center point or a center of gravity, so to speak. And that center point being the, the hub or the axis of things. When we start to look at our psychology, when we start to look at... Uh, esotericism, occultism, we may be able to use this metaphor to help us understand what our center of gravity is. As microcosm or little world, the Hagal rune represents the human being. As macrocosm or big world, it is the universe in its largest conceivable expansion. As little, it is an image and a reflection of, of the human being. It is the extent of one's physical and spiritual self-boundary, the boundary of our physical and spiritual self. As big, it is understood in the meaning of valuable and spiritually important. It is the human being, just the human being as is, as well as the perfected human being, and the macrocosm, the big world itself. The Hagal rune is the rune of humanity, and especially the rune of Adam, the androgynous first human. Because remember, Eve came from Adam, so they were, they were, there was a moment where they were one and the same. It is the symbol of creation, of the world circle, of the wheel of the world, 
This human being is a living Hagal rune, an, an, an analogy of the great Hagal, which is given by the zodiac. Indeed, the Hagal rune can also be thought of as consisting of the man rune in its reversal, uh, the woman rune or year rune. These two runes, man and year, may also be considered as the corresponding as corresponding to the celestial and terrestrial, the heavenly and earthly, the macrocosm, microcosm, the universe, and humanity. So those are the aspects that are mixed together in this rune. The male and female runes connected together there. The human family is symbolized by the Hagal rune, the humanity rune with its six branches and the one center point which elevates it to a seventh to the divine. The double Hagal rune is the symbol of reincarnation, of resurrection. So now he's laid um, two of them over top. So instead of it being six lines, there's 12 lines. It is also the spine of the 12th, 12 dorsal vertebra of Adam Kadmon, who fills out the world with his body and his spirit. Adam Kadmon is Kabbalistically the, uh, something like an archetypal human being, what we want to aspire to be. The spine of the heavenly body of the zodiac, the 12 parts, or yeah, 12 parts. 12 part zodiac of the heavens. Take care of the universe and care for it within yourself, and you are ruling the universe. Hagal is the Ur scaffolding, the spiritual Ur Christ, or the Christ Ur. Ur means U H R, not U R. U R Ur means a. Uh, Primordial, original. Ur, U-H-R, means clock or time. So that he's saying the Ur Christ or the Christ Ur, the time of God, eternity. Behold, I am with you every day, says the Christ, the Son of God. I am the beginning and the end. The Ur shape of the word Christ is indeed Aristos or Haristos. The Greeks and many others have replaced the H or aspiration sound with a K, G, I, or a CH, a CH sound, throat sound. All languages have taken over this Ur word, Hari, meaning the high one, and made it into Tri or Kri. Har is R, the superlative of which is the Haristos. Remember R we studied in the previous rune. It means uh, the eagle and uh, the sun, S-U-N. Haristos the Christos. In India, one of Vishnu's names is Hari. One of Vishnu's incarnations was Krishna. In Hebrew, Hari became Herez or Hama, meaning the sun. In Arabic, the word was changed to Harris, Harris, with the meaning of maintainer, protector. In modern Swedish, Hari means herein, or in this. Numerous artifacts show this Chrisman, or Chrisman, this Hariman, Hari man, or our man, already in pre Christian times. And as such, on a coin, uh, which is dated to at least 1000 BC, the chrismon originated from the Christ All Seal, the crystal seal of the high and holy rune name of the Lord, the rune name of the Lord, which was Arahari. He's going to uh, go in on this name, which for him is, is significant. It came into its runic image expression in the Hagal rune, and this we will explain below. 
Let's understand that in the Kala, the Nordic Kabbalah, Christ, Tristos, Charistos, Haristos, Aristos are all related to R, or R, the eagle and the symbol of the sun. They are also related to the term Aryan, Aryan, which is runically R-E-R. The second R rune reversed or flipped. These three runes together are understood as meaning R, the sun, Is, the self, and then R as earth, the self between the sun and the earth. This brings us closer to the mystery of the Son of Man and the Son of God. If we twist and turn the R rune around the Is rune axis, then we get four different positions which make the Hagal rune. These four R runes would be read as R, 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 R. Now we know this one is Kaun rune that we just reviewed. This, this is the rune number 10 that we'll study in a couple classes. It's the R rune, A-R. It's the A, vowel, A. Ah. So here he's got H, A, 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 but since it's R, it's going to be R, 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 and if the H is silent, it's just R, 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 R. If we attach these sounds of the Hagal and of the Is rune, the H and the I, to the four R runes, then we get the array of sounds, which we want to pronounce loudly, R, 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 He. R, 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 He, which he says, if we arrange them like that, they make this shape. By means of partial contraction and reversal of these rune sounds, you receive a word. This word speaks out the name of the highest god, Arahari. If we still add another rune, then we get the Ur runic image of the monogram of Christ. The X, or even it could be the uh, Hagal rune plus the Pard rune, which is part of the Bar rune. This symbol is composed of the X cross, which means the world or the universe, and the pard rune, the rune of the son or child, which is half of the bar rune, the mother rune. It is no coincidence that the Hagal rune is called the head of the Asir, Isir, the head of the Aristos, of the Haristos, which means the high one. Jesus was an Essene a word which reminds us of the Aesir, the Nordic gods. Here, the god self or divine self, the Is rune, the rune of the self, was nailed to the X cross of the god all or divine all, the world or universe. Investigating this rune more closely as consisting of the East rune and the X cross, the cross of St. Andrew, we receive more information. The X cross is composed of two lines, the ascending bar line, right? This is the same one that was in the Ka Kaun rune and the descending bulk line, bulk, the death line, the life line and the death line. This mystical grouping, related with the crucifixion, originated from the content of the ideas of these rune symbols. The East rune, the vertical line, and the Se rune, the horizontal line, is also called East Se, the plus sign or cross sign. Laid on top of each other, they result in East East, the God human, the All Christ, the Christ All which, as we know, is achieved with the help of the Divine Feminine. Let's now consider the other two crosses at the crucifixion. The right criminal is the East rune intersected by the bar line or life line. This is the criminal that's on the right of the Christ. There's two thieves, the good thief and the bad thief, that were crucified with Jesus in Christian 
uh, what's the right word, <laughs> in the Christian system. And the bar line makes, in this cross, the rune of wedlock or marriage, the Ehe rune. The left criminal, the one who's unwilling to improve, is the east rune intersected by the bulk or death line, which is the not rune. That's the rune we'll look at in the next class. The contrast, the law of polarity of all life, comes into play here by way of crossing or the action of two energies like fate and free will. There is always tension. As we have mentioned, the Hagal rune speaks the name Arahari. Ar is the sun, and Hari, the high one. Which, in the Greek language, took the form of the so-called monogram of Christ that contains the initial letters of the Greek word Christos. The X, the Greek Chi, Chai, and the P, the Greek Rho, as monogram of the Christ, still leads us to a further symbol. In Greek mythology, we know the centaur, Chiron, Chiron. What is a centaur according to mythical image? According to the mythical image, a man horse, a horse body and legs with a human torso, arms, and a head. Therefore, with the Greek letters Chi and Rho, we can justify the name of Chiron in a monogramistic sense better than the name of the Christ. In Chiron, we recognize an initiated person who teaches the noble youth all wisdom. Many great men have been disciples of Chiron, according to legend. Through the Nordic Kabbalah, the Kala, we can disassemble this symbol into Rossman, the horseman, Hirosman, Crossman, the Crossman, the Christ. But we also know the monogram of Christ, the Hagal, as the wind rose. Wotan's wind ross, or wind horse, named Sleipnir, the breath of the world. So that was also the, the uh, cross of, uh, I'm sorry, the horse of Wotan, the Nordic uh, Christ. The wind ross, the wind horse, therefore, is the cruce ross, the cross horse. The ross cruce, the horse cross, the cross in general. From the ross to the rose is only a little jump in the language of the mysteries, and we arrive at the rose cross, or Rosicrucians. One of the secrets of the ancient mystery orders was to veil their wisdom under these mysterious images, in order to protect the higher knowledge from the misunderstanding of the masses. So here is a uh, esoteric image, which he said is the uh, XP, right, the monogram of the Christ, mixed uh, with runic symbolism. Here it is inside a circle. He's got the wheel, uh, the hub, the axis in the very center. You got his circle, and he's got a six-pointed star, and he's got a uh, triple uh, swastika kind of thing turning, and he's got his runes, his 18 runes. So we're going to keep it moving here. I know we're <laughs> we're deep into it, but we got to keep it going. The uh, This is the last of the historical Kumar. Another two, three years later, Hagal, Hagal, according to Kumar, the H rune, Hagal, Hag all, all Hag, God all, Walhalla, Valhalla, Allah, world of all, man all, a grove to nurture or cherish, enclose, contain within oneself, all inclusive. The key to all murmuring runes. The holy great universe. Numerical value 7. The Hagal rune is the world rune. The world cross. The world tree. Around the middle point. The hub. The navel. 
of which the whole spiritual and physical world revolves, the rotating microcosm and macrocosm, the Hagal rune, the male-female fertility, I'm sorry, the male-female unity, and the all-world rune is also called the head of the Iseer, which means the highest initiation. But whosoever cannot and does not want to sacrifice themselves will never reach the All-Father, which is why Votan says to the, uh, on the world ash tree, but when he learns about the runes, he says, I consecrated myself to myself. The Hagal rune is the most perfect rune. It is masculine and feminine. It consists of man and year runes, the East rune and the Ge rune, the multiplication cross, but also the Not rune and the Ehe rune. It's a combination of lots of pairs. Hagal is the rune of the Holy Seven, the seven senses, the seven tones, the seven colors, and of the great filter of humanity, of the eternal wisdom in the divine, all-embracing of the all-embracing self. It is also called the seven hog cross, the old sevener, the seventh, the seventh knower. Hagal also reveals itself in the spatial directions of the snow crystals. Crystal is Christ all. All Christ, the Christ, the framework, the all framework, the universal framework. Christ is the carpenter's son, the son of God, of the universe, the world builder. Carpenter as a world builder. Christ all, the self-reflecting, the cosmic universe, the Christ all stone or crystal stone, Christ all ball, crystal ball in its mystery exercises to recognize the crystal in the reflecting crystal and to receive information about past, present, and future. The Hagal rune also corresponds to the south-north world axis, to the Ich rune and the Ge rune with their solstice points. From the Hagal rune, the wind horn, the turning horn, listening, hearing, procreation, Conception, creation. It is a salvation rune consecrated to the moon, which was formerly used for white magic purposes. And it was very disreputably used in its demonium, or in verse, as a magic character under the influence of the full moon. I think somebody else said it was Saturn, right? He says it's the moon. It corresponds to the moon. Hagal... The murmuring universe, the universal murmur that opens all the doors of spirit and of realization. The auspicious mandrake root in the form of the Hagal rune, or the mandrake root dug out at the new moon in the form of the wind horn, which is supposed to provide magical, supernatural abilities. The Hagal rune is also found in the hexagon and in the six pointed star which is the star of rebirth, of gender, of ascending and descending life in the world ash tree, Yagdrasil. The three upper branches are the world ash tree, Yagdrasil, the becoming, being and passing away, and its three roots point to the past, present, and future. So he gives these different shapes. It's interesting he calls this one the hexagram of the Germanic initiate sigil. And then this one, the all rune, all raun. The Hagal rune is also the symbol of the world wheel, the masculine and feminine circles of the 12 houses of the zodiac, wherein the high 13 is hidden. Here he gives the same Arahari, Ara Hari, which he says combined together into this symbol. The coin from the year 300 BC has the monogram of the Christ. It's a little small, but it's right in there between the legs of the eagle. The Hagal rune is the rune of the currents of the universe, of the air. It contains the great mystery 
the secret of the art of breathing. The Hagal rune shows us the recognition of divine liberty, the divine force, the divine unity and immortality with the cosmos and with eternity through which humanity will redeem itself. Humanity will redeem itself through immortality. According to him, the demonic of or the inverse of the Hagal rune is the Hagel rune. It means destruction, annihilation, death, hailstorm, wind, tension fracture, hatred, black magic, the unnurtured descendants sinking into darkness. Hagal to enclose the universe in oneself, to feel God, All Father, in the innermost self, who leads to the Holy Grail to divine sonship, S-O-N. All 18 runes of the Futhark, all the fine force streams of the microcosm and macrocosm, all spatial directions as well as forces of the heavens and the earth can be felt in the Hagal rune position. This one is the most complicated one, I think. So we're just going to read through it. It has four different parts. First is just to do a cross. Let me show you this graphic that simplifies it. Stand in the eastern position, then you go into a cross. This is the mantra, ha, and then you spin. That's pretty much how they all work. Stand in the ichrun position, out in nature if possible on top of a hill or a mountain, seven breaths. Then extend both arms to the side making a cross with palms facing up and feel the universal currents. And then softly sing, ha, while one slowly and rhythmically turns in a circle, staying a little longer in the north. Marby gave this same rune position in his magazine, and Coomer has expanded upon it, adding the following things. So, you do ha, and you spin, I would say clockwise. And then when you come back to the point you started, which he recommends facing north, then put your arms back and then back on the sides. And then you're going to put your arms out uh, in a, a not rune position, right arm up, left arm down, angled, and then spin and make the end sound. Then move into a cross after you spun one time and do ha. Then your arms opposite from before into the eh room position. Left arm up. Eh. Then back into a cross. And then you stop. Part three. Start in your east room position. You can do e or ha. Or e then ha. Then you do the man room position. Both arms up, mm, then the cross, then the tier rune position, tier or tate tito two, then the cross, and then you stop again. And then finally, after the east rune position, you do an X, so your arms are wide, your feet are wide as well, and you're going to do ha, and you're going to go uh, kind of, to keep your arms wide and, and walk, you kind of have to step just a little bit at a time. So you make a circle that way too. He says, for all positions, there's a clockwise turning while holding the rune position. For these four rune positions, these four rune positions pose a difficult task for the student because during its practice, one must not absorb any impressions. Thoughts must be completely eliminated, the mind emptied so that one's solar plexus as well as all occult force centers start to function and so that the fine all waves can manifest later as new thoughts, as concepts to the mind. One should not be astonished or excited if one has a perception, seeing a strange image, or hears voices. Instead, one should remain completely passive when perceiving impressions that were previously unknown. One must neither be excited nor concerned in this condition. These perceptions, often also images, 
do not occur immediately because the fine radio-like all streams must first begin to work inside the practitioner. It is often the case that one is forced to speak loudly during this exercise, so it is advisable to practice this rune alone in solitude if possible. Kumar says he cannot give an explanation about what a perception may be because these occur for each practitioner according to their stage of development and their purity. Also, later the student will be given information from the other side, in this rune position, about the Hagal rune mystery secret. Each one according to their type, Kumar reminds us again that silence is the law for the practitioner. The one who is experienced in the Hagal rune will have very great benefit from this position. In it, one is able to absorb high spiritual insights and to observe perceptions. After this four-part exercise, the student takes a brief pause in the Ich Rune position facing north with thoughts of love, harmony, and optimism. When the practitioner has sufficiently recovered, then seven rhythmic breaths, and the entire series is of the Hagal Rune is repeated again. The all streams penetrate threefold into the body of the practitioner and resound three times again in the back of the head, in the hands, and the feet. Finally, all the Hagal Rune positions are repeated again so that the student repeats them a total of three times. With the third repetition of the fourth rune position, it is recommended to focus the eyes on the root of the nose. That's this one. Later, the student will also feel the fourth dimension in their innermost self. With the Hagal rune, the practitioner also strongly influences their radiation, hence their astral colors. Already in the first few weeks of practice, one will notice with astonishment that one perceives soft colors and later one will see themselves vibrating in a bright yellow, blue, red, and so on. One always has good control over their development in these color scales. One solar plexus is always sending forth fine waves which are guided in this rune position through one's aura, and then they stream into the universe. Throughout the duration of the exercise, the fine waves continue to flow and stream away. New thoughts and concepts accumulate more and more in the subconscious in order to reveal themselves as advice or a solution. After this exercise, the student remains completely relaxed in peace thinking as little as possible or meditating on harmony and on all connectedness. Mostly, already in this state of peace, the practitioner of the, the practice, sorry, of the Hagal rune causes either clairvoyance, clairsentience, clairaudience, or a perception or revelation, or the practitioner is forced to speak, a new concept appears, advice is given to them, or something similar. The student does not forget that they are a receiver as well as a transmitter. Therefore, the sacred room position also requires pure noble thinking so that the advancing waves serve one's higher development but do not harm. Purity leads to perfection. All incoming and outgoing waves are always of the direction, height, and purity which correspond to the student's stage of development. Therefore, dear brothers, dear sisters, Strive with a pure heart in ardent longing towards the divine humanity, and you will receive heavenly waves and divine inspirations. Many thousands of years ago, this room position was one of the most sacred mystery practices of our priestly ancestors. It is a room position of the great mysteries as it, and is inexhaustible in its depth. All cosmic rune streams and fine force waves are similar. Nevertheless, they speak to humans quite individually, manifold differently, and are eternally inexhaustible. Only through one's inner ich, inner self, can may one penetrate into the highest runic magic and its mysteries or secrets. But whosoever believes that only their own findings, discoveries, and solutions are the true, right, and unique ones, has transgressed against the spirit of true higher development. For the Hagal rune position, the following phonetic formula is also given. Ha, he, he, ho, hu. Motto for this one, he gives his own motto, which is obviously uh, similar. 
Know all father in yourself. Vibrate in the rhythm of the universe. Then you control human and animal. The hand rune exercise or mudra is like making an H with the two thumbs connected together. The rune practitioner takes up the ich rune position, military at attention. This is followed by deep breathing three times. And then take that grip. Raising the arms upward with the thumbs touching while singing ha. Special importance should be given to good deep breathing. Remember that each rune grip is practiced three times for three minutes each, followed by a short pause. Since otherwise, no satisfactory collection of subtle force can be reached in the hand centers. This grip has a very strong ability to conduct the corresponding subtle forces, such that one feels if an electric current runs through, as if an electric current runs through the body. With deep immersion, astral perceptions and higher inner experiences occur here. This grip is a strongly whispering rune grip, meaning you may hear some whispers. Meanwhile, the thoughts are focused on universal love, cosmic connectedness, animated by the wish for consummate perfection. As usual, we need to circulate the energy gathered throughout the body when we're done. He says the, the uh, color you may see is an indigo blue. And you may notice a strong odor of ozone and sulfur on the middle and index fingers. Further sound formulas... He he ho hu, right? So ha he he ho hu. We're not going to cover this one, but he also talks about the magnetic gaze. It's basically take this, and the handout has this uh, on a piece of paper, so you can print it out and stare at it here. But we won't go into the details of it in the interest of time, because we need to study this Rosicrucian and Gnostic section. Let's hold on. Let's see if you guys have any questions or comments in the meantime. Doesn't look like it. All right. The Hagal rune according to Wiracocha. Beloved disciple, in the Espasa Encyclopedia, we find... Under the word alphabet, we find under the word alphabet all the ABCs of the world singularly known. And in first term is the Nordic runic, and second is the Anglo Saxon. Readers who have this encyclopedia at their fingertips, it was a Spanish encyclopedia, will observe at first glance that the runes must have been the genesis of all written languages. And with this intelligent understanding, we will already demonstrate how all the Latin letters even emerge from the Hagal rune. The Mexican Indians, the Mayans, when asked about the name of God, answered that God has no name, and that it was only an aspiration, a breath. And in order to express it, they aspirated as if pronouncing a German H. H is, therefore, the principle of the Logos of all the runes, and of all words. Because it symbolizes breathing in, right? Aspiration. But in, I'm sorry, in many, in many Mexican gods, we find the Odil Othil symbol, whereas in the gods of Egypt, we find the Ankh symbol. But it is the same Mexican symbol, only that the Egyptian formed a, it into a cross afterwards. However, in both Mexican and Egyptian symbol, they mean life. Thus, life is the origin of everything. And Christ said, I am the life, that is, the vital Christ, the Christonic life, or the Christonic substance, as we have called it. In this way, the monogram of the Christ, that we find on all the old pictures, has the same meaning as the previous ones, although this one conserves in the upper part a semicircle and the whole glyph 
in Greek means light. The monogram of the Christ is that XP that we looked at above. Light and life in themselves are consequently the same thing. He talked about this at the beginning of his um, astrology course as well. Light and life in themselves are consequently the same thing. Here we encounter the well-known symbol of Arahari, the spiritual sun. And thus, the Hagal rune is the most important of them all. There being no people in the world where it is not found as the most precious of symbols. In the south of Chile, in the cemeteries of the Mapuches, there existed before, we do not know if it still does now, more Hagals than crosses on the tombs. And thus we see throughout all of America and Europe that star of six points. Sometimes even in the east we have observed it. Although it's characteristic of the north. On ancient stones in Sweden we have found the word chrismon differing from the monogram of Christ only in the triangle which is at both ends, meaning the macrocosm and the microcosm. The emblem of Krishna is this, or Krishna, is the circle with a cross inside of it, a plus cross, and we repeat that it is also the emblem of Christ. Let's face it, it has the Greek letters C, H, R, X, and P. In Latin, it would be tree, or cre, and always signifies light. In a coin from 300 years before the Christian era, we already have this same monogram, the monogram of the Christ. Thus, the myth of Christ existed, as St. Augustine points out very well, centuries before the birth of the Nazarene, signifying that every instant, the life the light, that solar force which the ancients venerated and which was utilized through Jesus in order to give it a concrete form. Etymology of the name Christ, or Christos, is Aristos, or Haristos. To this day, the Greeks and many other peoples change the H for a K, G, I, and a CH. Clearly, he read Gorslebin, right? Gorslebin just told us about that. If R is the Son, then Christ, the Anointed One, is the Son Man, or Man of the Son. R, Har, Hari, Hara, was for the Indians the connection of Shiva and Vishnu, and that of Haro, the Highest, the Select, the Best, Aristos, Aristo. Aristo thus means the Best. Aristocracy comes from Aristos, the best, and from Kratos, strength or force. It can be translated as the best force. From the Hebrew Hari emerges Heres, son, and Heres in Arabic means the helper, the guide. Haris, Chris, Ar, son, and Hari, highest. We can say, the highest sun. Overlapping two Hagal runes, we get the twelve-pointed star, the column of Adam Kadmon, the twelve seats of the Grail Princes the ki of uh, King Arthur, the twelve apostles, and the twelve zodiacal signs. If we separate those runes from the arms above and below, meaning one man and another god, we have thus the meeting of man with God. So he's saying that uh, that the man and year runes can be symbolized as uh, human being and divinity. The masters say that Hagal, as a rune, signifies the interior, our connection with the divine forces. This rune applied gives confidence because the sign itself is recognized, is recognition, that we are gods and that we are in possession of the divine forces. It signifies triumph, although we have a special rune for triumph, which Wittakocha says is the Sig rune. 
However, since Hagal contains all the runes, then it also encloses the force of triumph. Its numerical value is 7. Let us remember our septenary composition and many other applications that this symbolic number have, or has. The Edda speaks of the Song of the Runes. And this was the song that was sung in celebration of the mysteries. Today we learn many things by heart. But what is required in school with regard to poetry is very little. Poets no longer have the merit as before. Tacitus, who saw the Germans celebrate their mysteries, says that from childhood they had to learn these runic chants that were 1,500 verses. The value of these verses has already been lost. The Edda itself is in verse and sounds very harmonious and very lyrical when they are recited, although even to those of us who know German, it is difficult for us to understand them. Hebrew letters, apart from the fact that they serve to express ideas and thoughts, have at the same time and separately numeric value and symbolic value, and are, above all, accumulators of force. The latter sense is what we are most interested in. For our ancestors, the letters, he's talking about runes also, were sacred and could only be used for sacred objects. Today, letters serve in order to propagate the greatest truths. And at the same time, with them, the greatest crimes are committed by spreading obscene and pornographic magazines or political and social lies. The ancient Nordics had a sacred respect for the runes and nobody would have been able to desecrate them in order to spread lies. With this same respect for the runic letters, it was through them that they wrote all their legends in verse, and the verse or rhyme cultivates the memory. This is why the Rose Cross adepts must love poetry and keep poets as privileged human beings. Now it is the poet who spontaneously writes the great conception of his thought and of his idea in verses. He intuits in the act of writing the greatest conceptions dictated by his own being made by God at that instant. In Sweden we have recently seen a multitude of runic stones that had engraved legends as prominent as that of Siegfried with the dragon, and around the picture the runes themselves were described describing the fact. In Bulan, there, where there are those large stones and those inscriptions are supposed to be 60,000 years old, plows and men are seen driving oxen, armed with a spear as a symbol of the priesthood. This means that the work of the farmer is a sacred work. The students of the runes must therefore do all things possessed with a religious feeling. We are trustees of, the, of all the goods of the earth, but we are not their owners. They are our gods, that is to say, those omnipotent universal forces that we can surely personify. A disciple had to ask us one day, Do you believe in a personal God? To a certain extent, we responded, but he was confused by our answers and protested it its ambiguity, demanding a yes or a no, to which we answered yes and no. The forces are impersonal, and so is the Christic substance. But it takes a bodily form in us, and for this reason we continued saying to the disciple, I believe that in you there is a personal God enclosed in a physical body. Liberate me from it, the disciple replied to us. We will, of course, answer him but not by killing him, but by gradually reducing his strength or force and giving him more strength or force, which seemed even more paradoxical. And in effect, it is, right? By gradually, we would say, Gnosis, eliminating the ego in order to awaken the being, in order to strengthen the being, the consciousness, the essence. By exercising ourselves in the runes, which may well be called our exercises, the body gains in physical strength, but evidently loses its spiritual agility, and this gives power in order to make God stronger in us. 
Let us begin this exercise by looking to extract the forces from this great room. Let us concentrate our thoughts on the great all, on the invisible world with all its inhabitants, which the Nordics call Valkyries, and our elementals, sylphs, sylphides, gnomes, salamanders, undines, calling them to our aid, and with this we enter into the terrain of practical magic. We cannot live without these beings. Let's make this rune the rune of them. The Hagal rune on a white piece of paper like this. Let us look at it for some time and then look up one meter higher and then we will see the inverted image. This is an optical effect, but for a moment it will help us in later exercises. So clearly that's, uh, except for it doesn't have the dot in the middle, it is the Similar exercise from Coomer, which is to concentrate. In general, it's almost the same, right? To concentrate on the the rune shape. And finally, from Samaelo and Veor, he says, Let us now talk of elementals, gods, devas, sparks, and flames. Let us remember the old Tiber himself, rising as a mist from within the waters of the river, which has its name in order to speak to Aeneas. O oh, you who are born of the race of the gods, who are bringing back to us the city of Troy, saved from its enemies, you who are preserving its citadel, Pergamum, for all time, do not be intimidated by the threat of war. The real persecution of the gods has ceased. Now I offer you to fight, but fight victoriously. But come now, so that you may not think what you are seeing is an empty dream. But I will give you a signal that you will not delay in recognizing. Certainly Virgil, the poet of Mantua, tells us that when this vision of Tiber vanished, Aeneas awoke, got up. Then, after rubbing his eyes, he ran around to see if he could discover the sign that the sublime elder had spoken about. Concretely, before his astonished eyes there appeared an omen. This was enough for him to state that the predictions of the god Tiber, an elemental deva from the sacred Italian river, had become totally fulfilled. These were times in which our Aryan root race still had not entered into the descending involutive cycle. Remember that everybody on the planet right now is... Uh, the Aryan root race. We're talking about something theosophical here, mentioned by Blavatsky as well, and not, as uh, the Nazis claimed, just uh, certain colors or groups of people, but everyone. The human mind had yet to be poisoned by the materialistic skepticism of the 18th century. The people had faith in their visions, and they worshipped the elemental gods of nature. All ye worthy ones, those who have reached the second birth, those have dissolved, those who have dissolved the ego and have sacrificed themselves for humanity's sake, listen to me, please. Upon the living rock, right there on the beach, you must trace the Hagal rune with a reed. Then you must call the little boat of the sacred swan. This is how you can travel to the mysterious islands of the fourth dimension. Afterwards, when this sacred sign, this marvelous rune, has been traced, you must chant the following mantras. Achak Chukanak, Achak Churaksan, Achak Noya, Iraji, Xiraji, Xiraxi. <sighs> That's a hard one. Xiraxi, Iguaya, Hiraji. So, Acha Chukanak, Ach. Xu Roxan Ach Gnoya Xi Roxi E Huaya Hiraji. Look fixedly at the holy Hagal rune, and with your heart filled with faith, beseech, ask unto the Roman harpy, the Nordic Urvala, the Scandinavian Erda, the primeval Sibyl of the earth, your own divine mother Kundalini, to send you 
the extraordinary little boat for you, moved by the sylphs. Oh, how joyful you will be when you embark upon the mysterious boat of the sacred swan towards the mysterious lands of Eden. But to you, the beginners, I advise you to render worship unto the holy gods, to work with the creatures of fire, air, water, and earth. You must not forget your divine mother Kundalini, since without her you cannot progress in this sacred science. You must remember that God has no name and that he is only an aspiration, a sigh, the incessant eternal breath, profoundly unknowable, unknown to itself. This is, by all means, the principle of the Logos, of all runes and of all words. Practice. Beloved disciples, you must profoundly meditate on the unity of life, on the great alaya of the universe, in the invisible world, in the parallel universe of the superior dimensions of space. Concentrate your thoughts on the Valkyries, the gods of fire, air, water, and earth. Agni is the god of fire. Paralda is the god of air. Varuna is the god of water. Gob is the god of the earth element. Through meditation, you can enter into contact with the gods of these elements. You must trace the Hagal rune on a piece of blank paper. Then afterwards, concentrate your mind on any of the four principal gods of the elements. Call upon them so that when it is necessary, they can help you. The Hagal rune and deep meditation will permit us to be put in contact with those sparks, with those ineffable flames. Uh, he also says in another book called The Mayan Mysteries, that was from The Magic of the Runes, draw the sign of the Hagal rune on a sheet of paper or on the sand with a stick. Thereafter, meditate profoundly on the unity of life, on the great pralaya of the universe, on the invisible world, on the parallel universes of the superior dimensions of space. Concentrate your thought on the Valkyries, on the gods of fire, air, water, and earth. To establish contact with the elemental gods, it is possible through meditation. Agni, the god of fire, Paralda, the god of air, Varuna, the god of water, Gob, the god of earth. And so these are complemented by, there's practices he gives to work with the elementals in uh, of these four elements in Arcanum 4 of Esoteric Course of Kabbalah. If you studied Arcanum 4, then you'd be able to look at that too. And finally, the there is a mantra here uh, that is mentioned in the end of the Esoteric Treatise of Hermetic Astrology, Hari. He says, Fortunate is the one who has a Guru Deva as a guide and director. Blessed be the one who has found the master of perfection. The path is narrow, straight, and frighteningly difficult. One needs the Guru Deva, the director, the guide. In the heart temple we find Hari, the being. In the heart temple we will find the Guru Deva. Meditation on the name Hari, the being, permits us to experience what is real, what is true. So I know we mentioned, uh, Gorsalbin mentioned this name, and so did uh, Widakocha. Here Samael and Veor says it's the name of the being, and we're meditating on this name which implies we could also uh, mantralize with it, can help us connect with it. So that's the end of uh, the material. As always, we have the handouts here at the bottom. But that's the end of the material that we were going to present for today. So we want to open it up for questions and comments, if you guys have any. Now's the time. Uh, thanks for your attention. Sorry about the technical stuff at the beginning. Hopefully that's ironed out now. Seems like it's a steady connection. I uh, just want to give it a little pause for the lag. 
see if you guys have any questions or comments. I know, know it was a long one, so we do appreciate you hanging in there um, the whole time. Those of you who are able to. Well, all right. It doesn't look like there's any more questions at this time or uh, or comments. So we're going to sign off. If you do have any, then feel free to leave them in the comments area or you can always email us, gnosticstudies at gmail. And as always, we want to wish you the best in your esoteric work. <laughs>